in the history of the church, the great hierarch of Christ, Nicholas the Wonderworker, Archbishop of Myra in Lycia, whose memory we celebrate on December 6th, according to our Orthodox calendar, has become glorious by just such an authentically holy zeal, with a decisive irreconcilability towards evil. Who does not know this wondrous hierarch of Christ? The most characteristic feature of St. Nicholas, which has given him such glory, is his extraordinary Christian mercy. The simple Russian people usually calls him Nicholas the Merciful, a title based on the facts of his life and the numberless cases of his help to men. But once this great hierarch, so glorious for his mercy towards his neighbor, performed an act which disturbed many and continues to disturb them even now, even though its authenticity is witnessed by the church tradition contained in our iconography and divine services. According to tradition, St. Nicholas took part in the first ecumenical council in Nicaea, which brought forth a condemnation of the heretic Arius, who denied the divinity of the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God. During the disputes which occurred in connection with this, St. Nicholas could not listen with indifference to the blasphemous speeches of the arrogant heretic Arius, possessed by pride, who demeaned the divine dignity of the Son of God and before the whole council he struck him in the face with his hand. This evoked such a general consternation that the fathers of the council decreed that the bold hierarch be deprived of hierarchical rank. But in that very night, they were made to understand by a wondrous vision. They saw how the Lord Jesus Christ gave St. Nicholas his holy gospel, and the most pure mother of God placed upon his shoulders the Episcopal Omophorion. And then they understood that St. Nicholas was guided in his act not by any evil, passionately sinful motives, but solely by pure, holy zeal for God's glory. And they forgave the hierarch, abrogating their sentence against him. By citing such a picturesque example, we do not in the least wish to say that every one of us can or should follow this example literally. For this, one must be himself just as great a holy hierarch as St. Nicholas. But this should absolutely convince us that we do not dare to remain indifferent or be unconcerned about the manifestations of evil in the world, especially when the matter is one of God's glory, of our holy faith in church. Here we must show ourselves to be completely uncompromising, and we do not dare enter into any sort of cunning compromises or any reconciliation even purely outward, or into any kind whatever of agreement with evil. To our personal enemies, according to Christ's commandment, we must forgive everything, but with the enemies of God we cannot have peace. Friendship with the enemies of God makes us ourselves the enemies of God. This is a betrayal and treason towards God, under whatever well-seeming pretext it might be done, and here no kind of cunning or skillful self-justification can help us. It is interesting to note how displeasing this act of St. Nicholas is to all the contemporary consenters to evil, these propagandists of a false Christian love, which is prepared to be reconciled not only with heretics, persecutors of the faith and the church, but even with the devil himself, in the name of universal love and the union of all slogans which have become so fashionable in our days. For the sake of this, these consenters strive even to refute the very fact of the participation of St. Nicholas in the First Ecumenical Council, even though this fact is accepted by our Holy Church and therefore must be respected by all of us as reliable. All of this happens, of course, because among contemporary people, even those who call themselves Christians, There is no longer an authentic, holy zeal for God and His glory. There is no zeal for Christ our Savior, zeal for the Holy Church, and for every holy thing of God. In place of this, there prevails a lukewarm indifference, an indifferent attitude to everything except one's own earthly well-being, with a forgetfulness of the just judgment of God which unfailingly awaits all of us, and of the eternity which will be revealed after death. 
And without this holy zeal, as we emphasized at the beginning, there is no true Christianity, no authentic spiritual life, life in Christ. That is why this has been replaced now by all kinds of cheap surrogates, at times quite low ones, which however often answer to the tastes and attitudes of contemporary man. And therefore such pseudo-Christians, skillfully covering up their spiritual emptiness by hypocrisy, often have great success in contemporary society, from which authentic spirituality has been rinsed out while authentic zealots of God's glory are despised and persecuted as difficult people, intolerant fanatics, people who are behind the times. And thus, even now before our eyes is occurring the winnowing, some will remain with Christ to the end, and some will easily and naturally join the camp of his opponent, Antichrist, especially when the hour of threatening trials will come for our faith when precisely it will be necessary to show in all its fullness the whole power of our holy zeal, which is abhorred by many as fanaticism. But at the same time one should not forget that, besides true holy zeal, there is also a zeal without understanding, zeal which loses its value because of the absence in it of a most important Christian virtue, discernment, and therefore, in place of profit, can bring harm. And therefore, only holy zeal for God, for Christ, without any admixture of any kind of slyness or ambiguous cunning politics, must guide us in all deeds and actions. Otherwise, a stern sentence threatens us. Because thou art neither hot nor cold, I will vomit thee out of my mouth. Apocalypse 3.16 Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Apocalypse 3.19. Amen.